Thank you very much. I would like to introduce uh, three distinguished Congress members of the United States House of Representatives. Uh, the first one, uh, Representative Brad Sherman. Uh, I think that the only one here from the Democratic Party. Um, here, in this stage, at least for the, at yeah, least for the next one hour. Yeah. Oh. For 20 minutes. Okay. Um, Brad Sherman represents California's uh, 30th con Congressional District, which include, as I understand, a huge number of Israeli Americans, mm -hmm. which means that you probably know how to notice this between different types of hummus. Okay, good. Welcome. Representative Joe Wilson. <laughs> Represents South Carolina, second coordinational district. There may not be as many Israeli Americans <laughs> as I understand in your district. Quite a few, okay. Um, but uh, Congressman Wilson has uh, been a strong supporter of Israel during his many years in Congress. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Last but not least, Representative Ed Royce represents California's 39 Congressional District and is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He's a no stranger for many people here in this room and has many friends in the Israeli-American community. Thank you all for joining us today. So after the first panel, uh, I, will, I would like to do, to do it in uh, Israeli style, which means that instead of many agreements, we will try to find where we disagree. <laughs> it's our Jewish do DNA. I will try. Um, so I would like to start with you, uh, Mr. Sherman, as a member of the Democratic uh, Party. When you see the gaps between uh, the parties, uh, both parties, on basically, I would say, everything today, and the strong support uh, of uh, President uh, Trump towards Israel, one day, I think one day President Trump will not be in office. And I'm not saying when, and I'm not saying why, but one day. Do you see any chance that the bipartisan support for Israel will be affected then? I can't think of anything more important than making sure that support for Israel continues to be a bipartisan objective. Because looking worldwide, Israel has one friend in the world, and Israel will be in much worse shape if Israel has only one half of one friend in the world. Now, some in my party, look, we're, we're not fran uh, fans of Donald Trump. And there's a Trump derangement syndrome, which is whenever Trump says anything, we have to do the exact opposite. For example, I'm grateful that he did not put out a tweet in favor of Mother's Day because I would have had some supporters urging me to come out against Mother's Day. You could support the Father's Day. Uh, again, I don't want to have to do the exact opposite of what right. uh, Trump does. So we're working to make sure that it is uh, bipartisan and a, at a time when almost no other issue is bipartisan. I mean, I mentioned Mother's Day, that remains bipartisan. But whether it's how to deal with guns, how to deal with opioids, how to deal with, uh, it, it, increasingly the parties are separate and that's why we need uh, to work inside both parties uh, to make sure that America is pro-Israel regardless of who's in Congress, regardless of who's in the White House. And you're not afraid that the day after President Trump there will be people that will like to eliminate uh, different types of uh, policy that Trump uh, adopt, and one of them will be the support for Israel. That may be a concern. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, it's not always that the Democratic Party has had to show its 
pro-Israel bona fides. Uh, Truman was far more pro-Israel than, than the Eisenhower administration, if you remember 1956. And uh, so my party has a long history from its initial recognition of the state of Israel. And I think that we need to uh, uh, resist the, uh, the Trump derangement syndrome that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Congressman Wilson, I would like to ask you on um, the unstoppable desire for agreements, for papers in the Middle East. Um, it seems that every time a new president takes office, they are certain that they are the ones to achieve this agreement in the Middle East, time after time. But do you have any good explanation why to focus on a process in the Middle East uh, that no one actually can describe, uh, understand or even pronounce with uh, words as we saw at least in the last uh, meeting between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Trump, when you have so many challenges uh, domestically and the board. Well, uh, Doctor, actually, uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, honored to be here, and you saw uh, a level of uh, bipartisanship just now uh, with Brad Sherman, and then we're very fortunate with uh, Chairman Ed Royce, uh, our ranking member, Elliot Engel. Uh, we do substantially work together uh, but uh, when you mention about a focus on peace process, uh, actually we have a, uh, a new president with Donald Trump whose first focus is not on a, uh, as you say, um, uh, some type of uh, vague peace process. His, pros his uh, focus is to establish and maintain a strong relationship with the state of Israel and the people of Israel. And it's, it's so refreshing that instead of um, focusing on something that can't even be identified, uh, that we have a president with Donald Trump who uh, has made it clear that he wants to work with Prime, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, we've seen in the United Nations, and I'm really thrilled, my uh, home state uh, governor, Nikki Haley, was here Saturday night. Uh, very clear. But still, if I may, there are many, um, I, would, I would say, representatives in the world, in the international community, that speak about a peace initiative. Uh, well, President Trump peace hey, initiative, which I don't know what, what does it mean. Well, but, but hey, uh, President Trump is for Israel. And he wants, to hey, he wants to reverse uh, the uh, tragic uh, lack of veto uh, that occurred last December. That was horrifying. Uh, and and <laughs> with, so we, we have, instead of a focus uh, on a bizarre peace process uh, that cannot be identified, Donald Trump with uh, Nikki Haley leading the way in the UN is uh, truly identifying that we are, are for Israel, for a strong national defense. Uh, I was honored to speak to Sheldon Adelson earlier about, uh, I'm on the Armed Services Committee too, Chairman Reddy and the subcommittee, to uh, promote our missile defense. We need to protect the people of Israel. That's our first, because protecting Israel is protecting America. Thank you very much. Congressman Ed Royce, as the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, can you tell us how the Congress is going to deal with the Iranian deal? Uh, to be more specific, uh, President Trump said that the Obama deal is a bad deal, and uh, I think that many people agree with that. Um, what does that mean from your perspective, and how does it become a policy? What influence does Congress have with Iran to limit its support uh, for terrorism, not to mention it's a nuclear program, or we all dealing just with the tweeting and uh, declarations. One of the um, one of the powers we do have is with respect to the ICBM program. Uh, Ash Carter made the point before the Congress that intercontinental means from Tehran to here. And it's driving this point that I think allows us to get the support on both sides of the aisle to get a bill through which now sanctions those institutions that are involved in the missile program and any foreign bank or any foreign company that is involved in supporting that. That is the legislation that I just passed out of our committee and off of the floor of the House. And so... <clears throat> 
so we have an opportunity to engage in a way that allows us to do what we originally wanted to do. Those of us, myself, Elliot Engel, and our co-sponsors here, we had a bill at the time when the President was negotiating secretly with his Secretary of State. Our bill passed overwhelmingly, and it was to give the Ayatollah a choice between economic collapse or real compromise on his nuclear program. We have got to get back to the tools that do that. And by focusing on the IRGC, the Iranian, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, we are focusing on the entity that controls the big businesses in Iran. So we have, we have leverage to force the Europeans on this issue. We have passed that bill out. But you know that since this agreement was signed, uh, we see that uh, it more or less uh, five billion dollars are invested in uh, Iran by uh, French, China, and others. We saw $600 million from UK, a few hundred uh, million dollars from uh, Russia on weapons. Do you think it's really, we really can change what's happening now, which, again, we all agree, w which was a bad deal? Yeah, we all agree it was a bad deal. We, we led the fight. I led the fight in the House against it. But the, the reality is it's going to depend on enforcement. It's going to depend upon whether or not this administration is willing to say to Europe and our other trading partners, there is a know your customer rule and you are in violation of it right now because you're dealing indirectly or directly with the IRGC. It, it is an opportunity also, I believe, to restart an initiative which for the last eight years, or longer actually, has been on the wrong uh, course. And that is to broadcast into Iran and with social media, radio and television. Re regime change should be the objective here. It should be, look, we saw what Reagan was able to do in Eastern Europe when two thirds of the people wanted the end of a totalitarian system and we had to ratchet that up to 85%. I was there on an exchange program to see this work in 1985. We have an opportunity, two-thirds of the people in Iran today tell Gallup they want a Western-style democracy with no theocracy, no theocracy. We should have been reaching out to the people of Iran with the idea of putting those voices on social media, radio, television, while we now enforce what sanctions we can on Europe. A lot of the toothpaste is out of the tube, as you know, doctor, because it was 100 billion in relief they got. We're now trying to figure out ways to reapply that through the force of law and through trading arrangements that, that Europe and Asia have with the United States. Thank you. Yeah, we are in Israeli style. You can <laughs> add your comment whenever you want. Both proponents and opponents of that deal understand and agree that we can impose new sanctions on Iran as long as they are proportional to Iran's non-nuclear wrongdoing. There is no resource in the world in greater abundance than non-nuclear evil from Tehran. When you see almost 500,000 civilians killed in Syria, you know where the thugs come from, you know where the command and control comes from. When you see tens of thousands of people in Yemen die, when you see their missile program, when you see what they do to their own citizens, the amount of evil that comes from Tehran exceeds all the sanctions we can think of. And, Sue, we ought to be making it clear, and I'll take a company, Mercedes, that you cannot sell trucks to the IRGC and sell C-Class on Wilshire Boulevard. We have got to make it plain to companies around the world. You do business in Iran or you do business in the United States. And if we do that effectively, the Ayatollahs will come to the United States begging for a renegotiation of everything. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question, and I would like to ask every one of you. Um, on the foreign aid uh, to Israel, there were many ideas in the past couple of years to cut aid money for uh, this process. 
there are also Israelis who think that uh, we have become too dependent on the, the American foreign aid package. In a short sentence, because we have a short time, what do you think the future and uh, the goal of the Congress is on the amount, uh, on this amount of money? Let me, uh, Sorry, yeah. let me just point out that with respect to the challenges that Israel faces, those challenges are growing arithmetically. And the reason they are is because the Iranians have trained Hezbollah and also have put IRGC troops and other Shia militia, not just now in Lebanon. And we just, we had pressured Harari to do something. Uh, in August, I met with the prime minister in, in Israel, and we heard about the two-front problem, Syria, beyond the, beyond the Golan, uh, where there's a weapons factory now that has been put together by Iran, and also there are two of them. Uh, by the way, the prime minister called me recently and he said, Ed, you know those two weapons uh, factories? There's only one now. An important point. But, but here is the bottom line. For us to be able to counter the number of rockets and missiles that are being built or being supplied, it is going to take a greater effort on the part of the United States. In 2006, I was in Haifa when the rockets were coming in. And there were 600 victims in the trauma hospital at Rambam. There were only 10,000 rockets left in the in inventory. Now there's 130,000 plus. Back then, what did we do? We worked with Israel. Actually, it was the scientists in Israel and the engineers that developed a comprehensive strategy to deal with that threat. But the, the caliber and quantity is not large enough to deal with the new missiles and the new range that are being shipped in, that are being developed by Iran. This requires the United States not to do less, but to do more. The qualitative military so you edge, support Israel, in expanding the we, we need to develop jointly with Israel a strategy for dealing along the northern border and the eastern border, just as we did with the tunnel detection and um, intervention program, interdiction program, where we saw last Monday, uh, last time I was in Israel in August, I again went into one of these tunnels and I met with the group developing this facility with U.S. help. You saw last Monday what happened. They blew up that tunnel with 12 uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad fighters. Now we're going to have the opportunity to apply that same technology to the Lebanese border, Thank which, you very which is necessary. So we have to do more, and Israel has to do more, because Iran right okay. now is the greatest threat. Thank you very much. And, and a, more or less. Hey, hey. To, to, to back up the chairman, he's absolutely correct. When we think of foreign aid, yes, it benefits the people of Israel, but it benefits the people of the United States, particularly in regard to missile uh, defense and development. Uh, as we see the threats of the thousands of rockets and missiles and artillery pieces in North Korea, by using the example of what we've learned in uh, Israel, we're also protecting uh, our, our allies around the world. So uh, foreign aid is mutually beneficial. It's not just one way. Thank you very much. Our military aid to Israel is roughly one half of 1% of our total expenditures on national security. What of our expenditures on national security is more effective than the one half of 1% that we give to Israel, which is right there on the front lines, defending the world from people who want to kill both countries. Thank you very much. So I thought that I will be able to, uh, to create some debates here, and I failed. You all agree that we need to support Israel, and thank you very much for that. Representative, uh, Representative Brad Sherman, Representative Joe Wilson, and Representative Ed Royce, thank you very much for supporting Israel and being thank here. Thank you to the thank IAC. You. Here, here.